I must invest in a chair that doesn't squeak. Oh, I know. A, a, a wobbly wheel is the is the bane of my life, you know. It's been a crazy kind of week. It has kind of. Let's let's cut to the chase here and, and talk about the main topic of the week. Andrew McClellan, Gosforth Handyman, you have surpassed the 10,000 subscriber mark uh, uh, on, you, uh, on your YouTube channel. Thank you. I wouldn't have said that was the main topic of the week. We've launched a podcast. For the, for the listeners who don't know, <laughs> going through the 10,000 mark, it kind of, the, the 10,000 subscriber point is roughly where you, you stop being a small YouTuber effectively and you become whatever the next step is. I don't know. So congratulations on that. Obviously due in no small part to being the co-host of an extremely popular podcast oh um, definitely but also you were you were anointed by the the godfather maker himself sir james of deresta gave uh, gave gosforth handyman a shout out on the making it podcast a couple of weeks ago didn't he yeah that's right he, he gave us a quick shout out uh, a couple of weeks ago which was awesome thank you very much jimmy he's a top guy me and jimmy had been chatting on email over the last year or so anyway about various people freebooting our videos and and um basically taking our videos and using them without permission which isn't very nice when that happens no sure well they're still in views and you know it's it's not it's just not on it's happened to a lot of makers out there where they've basically just taken their content and, and put it onto their own channels and it's a bit frustrating to say the least it's um it's not an all right thing to do under any circumstances whatsoever <laughs> So 10,000 subscribers, not only 10,000 subscribers, but rapidly galloping towards 11 as well. So uh, how long did it take overall? I think it was June 2016, I think, I set the channel up. But you see, I've not been very good with putting out regular content until probably over the last few months, I would say. And that's been my main kind of downfall on the channel is that when I first set it up, I was maybe putting out a video every couple of weeks and then I would do the odd one where I'd put out a couple of week and then you do a, have a massive gap and then and YouTube really doesn't like that YouTube likes regular content and you're really good at that you're I'm always seeing a, a video at least twice a week from you even when you're really busy it varies a little bit and I, I will be cutting back on the Tuesday videos I, I, I do a, a quick Tuesday tip type video which is only a couple of minutes long and they're they're you know Sometimes they're very popular. Sometimes they just get a few thousand views, you know. But whatever it is, though, over the year they they add up because watch time watch time counts. But it, it's just an extra little, you know, something to break the week up a little bit, and then do a, a regular Friday content. Because uh, I'm so busy at the moment, actually, I, I I've got a video, a three parter coming out, and normally I'd post those daily. I'm actually going to split that one out weekly, just because I, I haven't got time to to do them. Um, so I'm going to. I've got a, a sort of a roughly 10 minute video every every week for the next few weeks uh, and I'm popping in the little Tuesday ones when I can kind of thing but yeah I mean when I set up the the YouTube for for, for me I decided to to commit to doing one a week for a year uh, and just to see how it goes uh, and it's gone pretty well yeah I think that's really worked well for you I think the fact that you've kept to a consistent program of when your videos are coming out I think you know that that is quite a key thing even in the last couple of months, I've been saying, right, I'm definitely always going to do a video on a Saturday morning. And now we're at Friday and I don't have any video ready for tomorrow morning. But it's just been one of those weeks where I put a video out last Saturday, which was just a tips video, which I thought, right, I, I need to get a Saturday morning video out because that's supposed to be my slot. And then we had the podcast launch video on the Monday. And then it just happened to be on the day of the podcast launch, I hit the 10K subscribers. So obviously I'd already filmed the 10K subscribers Q&A video ready to go live, but I didn't want that to go live on the same day as the podcast launch video because it would just kind of get lost. So then I've had that one come out on Wednesday, but that's me off the schedule again. So <laughs> Yeah, I, I used my, uh, obviously we both put a little a little launch video out to promote the, the podcast on Monday when it launched. Uh, and I've used that as my in the week video and I'll have the the regular video at, uh, today on on the uh, on the Friday, Good Friday, because uh, we can record this a, a week or so in advance. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, I think you mentioned in your uh, 10k video that it's only a, a few months between hitting 5,000 subscribers and getting to 10. That was the same for me. It you know it seems to take forever to get to sort of 5,000 subscribers, and then suddenly you're at 10. But then actually getting to 10 seems to take forever. The last thousand views. 
seemed to just oh it was just dragon it was but the thing was but between 5000 and 8000 ish i was starting to get like 100 subscribers a day or thereabouts and you know it was it was looking really good i was hitting a thousand subs a week nearly and it was like wow that that's really cool and then suddenly you think oh how how big's this going to get and then suddenly it just slowed down but i checked on social blade of a lot of other youtubers and i, I can't did we talk about this offline i can't remember but oh i think we did offline yeah it, it comes and goes in waves doesn't it it's um... and, uh, everyone that i checked had the same dip around the same time so it could just be some weird youtube algorithm change yeah. or or something like or that or holiday it, periods or, or whatever yeah. else yeah you made it to, to 10,000 subscribers on your way to 11. Congratulations. That's uh, that's great news. That's that's really Thank good. Thank you very much, Peter. That That is much a way. You're coming up to a fairly big milestone as well. You're you're not far off the 20. Uh, we're, we're cre- again, we're creeping creeping my way <laughs> upwards slowly. Have you got anything planned for, tw- for hitting 20, or are you not going to do 10K celebrations for hitting 20 i don't know actually i haven't I haven't really i haven't really done anything for any other ones so uh i, I for twenty thousand, yeah i probably do probably do something a bit special i don't know when that'll happen so uh. so anyway the podcast has launched to uh much fanfare and ballyhoo uh and it seems to be going pretty well it's isn't it absolutely you know what it is i'm genuinely when we started to get the response back from people and stuff was almost almost took your breath away in a in a literal kind of sense we've had I think the last I checked, 22 five-star reviews on iTunes now, it, well into the thousands of, of downloads and listens and stuff. And just the feedback, absolutely, really taken yeah, aback. It's fantastic. The, feed, the feedback we've been getting through Twitter uh, and, and personally through email and also on the, on the YouTube channel, uh, because the podcast is available on, on YouTube as well. Absolutely fantastic. I had, I had somebody in, in my Patreon, because we, uh, we both uh, put a little teaser uh, for the podcast out on on our Patreon uh, for our Patreon supporters, uh, and somebody commented that like it was like finding your wife in bed with your mistress. He said, and then in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> <said that>. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. Uh, so yeah, great stuff. Uh, thank you, everybody who's uh, who's listened. Thank you to everybody who's who's downloaded the podcast. And I know we ask. I, I've been asking people to to review it and rate it if they can on iTunes. I know that not everybody is an iTunes user, and I know most people don't like iTunes very much, but it is the only place that you can rate or review podcasts. So uh, it, it does make a difference if, if you can find the time to do that for us. Those positive reviews, positive ratings do help push us up the stack. Thank you to everyone. Absolutely amazing, amazing response. Um, we are going to just keep plowing away. And- we, we will indeed. We'll keep cracking on and see what uh, uh, see what else we can come up with. I do have a little bit of follow-up of my own, actually, on uh, uh, on episode three. Uh, I mentioned that I had a Stanley, uh, excuse me, I mentioned that I had a DeWalt compressor. And it's actually a Stanley. It's probably the same one you've got, actually, Andy. It's a little four and a half litre or five litre one. Is it incredibly loud? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it sounds like the one that I've got. Yeah, it's a great little thing, but I, I was getting confused with my yellow and black, thinking it was DeWalt, it was actually a Stanley, and also said I had a Maestri 16-gauge nailer stapler. It's actually an 18-gauge nailer stapler, just in case people are scouring the stores for something that doesn't exist. On your compressor, on your little Stanley compressor, do you use it much? Or? I don't use it a lot, to be honest, no, but, uh, you know, it's, it's handy to have. I mean, I find it fantastic. If I was to purchase it again, I would definitely be going for a, a quieter one other than that it's great for something i can just chuck into the the back of the truck and take on to to any job and have all my air tools there and that although it is too small a volume to use with things like air sanders and stuff it just doesn't generate enough air it'd be, it'd be running all the time so no yeah it would literally be on constantly so but for nailers and that it's absolutely fine but the one thing i find on it is you know when you plug the air cable the air pipe into the physical compressor does that whole assembly not feel like it's about to drop off it feels like it's only held together by the pipe work itself it, it may well be actually <laughs> I've, I've had the cover off and had a look inside and it's all pretty uh, pretty rudimentary in there it's just where where the where the actual air outlet comes out which is in a place right on the very corner of the machine where you're going to bash it all the time yeah that's right and if anything's going to fall over and hit it it's going to hit that outlet and i just find whenever i'm plugging anything into it it just feels 
that that's the one bit that I don't want to be flimsy, and that bit just feels a bit kind of I have to support the whole assembly with my hand while I'm plugging something in to, to stop it from. It just feels like it, over time that would just kind of break. I don't know. Well, what what mine has started doing is blowing fuses when I when I started up. I don't know why. Um, it's a bit weird. Uh, I just bought some bigger fuses. Problem fixed. <laughs> Seems to have cured the problem or, or masked the problem, whatever it is. Problem was. solved. There we go. Before getting into the topic of the week, how is your big project going? Oh, God. Uh, it's it's going. It's it's hard work. It's become work, not fun. <laughs> it really is a bit of a slog. Uh, but it's going. It's going. I've got the last big piece of furniture built uh, this week. It's a bunkette, which is like French for a box with drawers in basically uh, so it's going to have an upholstered top uh, a seat uh, and it is a, a big box with drawers in uh nine foot long 20 2700 long uh, just just low about 460 high and with three drawers in 2700 long did you say yeah and about nine foot oh it's huge it is big i can just about lift it wow uh, but the headache is it's got face frame and drawers so they've got to fit nicely and of course you can't do that until it's built and i was hoping to do it in parts then component spray it then build it then get the drawers in but of course i've got you've got to build it before before you can get the, the drawers fitted and fettled properly. So I've had to make it. Is this an oil finish you're going for on this, was it? Uh, no, it's going to be water-based. Uh, w- a, a varnish, though, or is it... Um, no, no, it's uh, painted. Oh, it's painted. I, I, weren't you doing something with veneer? Or? Yeah, the what it is, I'm, I'm putting little alcove cabinets into a variety of alcoves, and the cabinet part is veneered in Sapili, and then the face frame and the doors sprayed. Oh, wow. That'll look lovely. I love that kind of combination of, of dark wood with white. I think that works really well. It should look nice, but uh, yeah. So have you, to make all that work, I suppose it would only be for the veneered bit, have you had to do many kind of long bevel mitre cuts or? No, be- because the cabinets are all hidden behind the face frame. You don't actually have to do anything fancy. Do you ever do those long 45 degree bevel cuts? I've done a few. I've always done them on the track saw. Do you find that works all right on the track saw? I've, t- I've tried it on the track saw and I find the weight of the track saw is always trying to kind of pull away from the bevel, if that makes sense. Is there some trick I'm missing? You need a, a firm pressure on the on the base plate of the of the saw. You need to get the material supported all the way underneath. Uh, and it's one of the few times when I do actually clamp the rail down. I've always done those sort of cuts on the table saw. And even on the table saw, they're, they're tricky. Because if you get any movement at all, you've completely screwed up your, your mitre. So if you are halfway through a big, long, especially if it's a nice piece of veneer or something like that, if you're halfway through the cut, and bearing in mind you're putting, trying to get a perfect 45 degree bevel on it, if the bit of wood lifts slightly, if it just drifts, if there's any blade wobble, anything like that, and you've got a gap in your join. And I did try it with the track saw and I just found it really tricky. Maybe I just need to persevere and, and, and practice a bit more with it. So the big project. It's uh, planning on. I'm starting. I'm doing a little bit of painting in in the for the family in the in the house. So I'm starting that next week. So I'm going to be kind of double shifting, going up to to North London to to do a bit of painting, and then coming back to do an afternoon and an evening in, <laughs> in the workshop, just to grind through the work. I'll be in this weekend doing a get these drawers made for this uh, banquet. I, I'm seriously considering getting the bigger pieces, sending those out to get sprayed, actually, rather than I'll, I'll do the little face frames and bits and pieces. It's well-funded, let's put it that way. So there's 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 money to spend on a, 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 to have it sprayed if, uh, if I need to have it done. Sounds like a sensible a sensible route, a, a lot less stressful. Yes, exactly. That's the thing. You know, it, you know, as much as I love my work, I don't want to be spending every afternoon, every evening for the next sort of couple of months working myself to the bone just to get this just to get this done, I'd much rather pass some of the uh, responsibility on to somebody else. And how about you? You've got your your, your workshop back? Is it? Uh, have you got rid of your display stands or whatever you? Yeah. Doing? So that job's all done and dusted. So the the eight display stands are all shipped off to the customer, and they're now doing all their pre exhibition staging and and basically planning how they're going to be using them for this uh, exhibition that's coming up in. June, which I will tell you more about when I'm allowed to tell you about it, but it's still I think it's still embargoed at the minute. I've still got more to do on that job. So the 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 big display stands are all done and out the shop, which is great because it kind of frees up a, a, a lot of space. It's always nice when you kind of get your shop back 
after a big project like that. Um, but now I've got all these smaller kind of little display cabinets that are going to be sitting on the display stands, but they're all, they're quite nice. They're just, lots of little boxes, all different sizes, and just MDF, just they need to look nice and sleek, and just little MDF boxes to hold various things in different places on these display stands. So that that's quite yeah. a nice little project that nice no, so i'm looking forward to working on something small again you know after this big mahoosive things i'm um, it's always tricky yeah. um especially if you're just working by yourself and you're trying to come up with all these ways of like supporting bits and as you say even just lifting the thing onto like your assembly table or or just physically getting it out the door you know there's so many things that you need to consider when you're putting these big pieces together and yeah well this this big bunk out thing uh, you know it's so big if it's on the assembly table and I can't cut anything, if it's on the other other side of the bench, then I can't use the router. So I've got to come up with some way of sort of hanging it half off the bench, half on props or, or something to just to get it out of the way, but still accessible so I can get these drawers made and fitted. So yeah, it's it, it's not easy. And uh, generally speaking, I wish you'd live closer. Yeah. <laughs> then, I, then we, we could get you in to give us a hand. That would be great. I've had a couple of people say that on Gary <laughs> Thompson up in Aberdeen. Um, we've we've been chatting a bit, now, and he does. Be, I don't know if you've seen his channel at all, but he I haven't. Heard. Oh, well, there's a pick of the week one, but uh, I'll, I'll mention it later on. But he does kind of what we do, but all made out of solid oak and beautiful. You know, really, really, it's it's another whole level of of stuff. But he's been a, a joiner, I think, for his en- entire life, and uh, he turns his own feet for furniture nice. and he turns his own rosettes and things for all the the solid oak stuff and it's just saying oh if i lived a bit closer i would have come and give you a hand lift that thing on your bench or whatever and it's like yeah well you're up in aberdeen you're down in london yeah. peter <laughs> yeah we need we will we'll need to move to the midlands or something anyway. well yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so the the exhibition stands are all kind of done i'm on to the the next little bit of it and um and now i've got a whole lot of i've got a as I think I was saying last time, a couple of alcove jobs to do, an understairs cupboard thing to do. And now, and you know what it is, I'm up to paperwork phase, so I'm probably not going to be in the workshop for the next few, few days because I need to get all these detailed designs done. For uh, These are ones where the customer's paid for uh, the initial deposit and paid for the initial design. They're happy with a draft design that I've put together. They're happy with the costs. And now I'm at the point where I need to do a, a detailed design on SketchUp, mainly so I can work out, obviously, things like cutting plans and stuff. But I'll also take that detailed design back to them and make sure they're 100% happy with it before I start actually cutting bits of wood. So that that's my next plan on those ones. Absolutely. It's always easy to, easy to change the plans, much harder <laughs> once it's been cut out of solid, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's yeah. uh, me back behind SketchUp for a bit. Um so yeah, we're going to be talking a bit about tech, weren't we? I think we were. We we sort of drifted into it a little bit last week, and we talked about tech for quoting and estimating, but we didn't really get into anything um, uh, 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 talking about sort of daily tech. And I was thinking that you know the 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 tech we touch more than anything is probably our pocket computers. We call them smartphones, but they're you know they're extraordinarily sophisticated little devices now uh and they really do have mine certainly had has had an impact on the way that i conduct my business in particular you know seemingly mundane things like parking like you know paying for parking with an app on your phone has has completely changed my working week uh my i don't know about you andy but my uh, I, I i don't think parking madness is restricted entirely to london i think it's something that sort of propagates across the country it's you know local authorities just you know take the take the mick all the time um with with parking charges and and things but my working week prior to to pay by phone pay by app parking would comprise of always either starting or ending with me at a bank trying to chivy a hundred quid's worth of pound coins out of one of the cashiers. And every flipping time, it would be like, oh, nobody's ever asked for that before. Yes, I was in here last week doing exactly the same thing, the same as I do every week. Because, you know, as mad as it is, the way I have to pay for parking is by feeding flat pieces of metal into a flipping machine to buy time which then the local authority has to collect i mean this is just the 
the, the most stupid thing imaginable. So finally, uh, there's a, a an outfit, and I think it's national here in Britain, called Ringo, uh, that sits on top of the parking infrastructure, which is why local authorities love it, because it's not eating into their charges. And it facilitates a, a payment system on top of the, the, the local authorities. So, you know, you pay a 40 or 50 pence charge or whatever it is on top of the parking charge for the facility uh, and then they charge you they stick you another you know 30 or 40 pence or whatever it is for the for the text message to confirm it and the same again to warn you that when it's running out um, and there's no way around that you can't opt out of that but that's you know that's changed the way I can park and how I can conduct my business dramatically so do you in London um do you generally is, is everywhere either permit or or meter parking how how yeah, does it's, it it's it's usually mixed residential or or permit parking um or, or pay pay by meter parking and it's overwhelmingly switched to pay by phone pay by app local authorities are, are twigging to the fact that uh you know they don't need to have group four security or whoever be running around collecting coins out of these machines and then banking it they can do it all online which makes far more sense so yeah it's overwhelmingly and it does vary borough by borough as to how it works exactly but it's all using the same app uh yes because the app sits on top of uh, whichever local authority because of course the local authorities are their little mini fiefdoms they they don't sort of talk to each other uh, you, you get sort of crazy things happening in london uh, you, you may well get this where uh, outside of london as well but where the different boroughs where one ends and the other starts you find things like the cycle lanes just stop <laughs> they literally end at a, at a set of traffic lights you know don't get me started on councils <laughs> it's nearly as bad as facebook the thing that we're, I'm, we're finding now is that some local authorities are getting into the whole, oh, the clean air initiative. So if you have the temerity to drive a diesel vehicle, they charge you extra. It's like an extra four quid an hour to park. Four quid an hour extra? Extra to park a diesel vehicle. Which is crazy because, you know, a diesel vehicle, when it's parked, isn't emitting any fumes, you know, but you almost want to leave the engine running just to say, yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm literally holding my head in my hands at the minute. And again, I, I've nothing against black cabs, black taxis, uh, handy cabs, the, you know, salt of the earth, nurse cabbies, the, the, love them to bits, but they're the ones who get the brake. They don't get the charge. They don't pay the congestion charge. They can use bus lanes. They, they, they don't, you know, don't get hit for these sort of clean air initiative things. They're, they're exempt from all these things. And yet those are the guys who are doing 200 miles a day. Those are the guys whose engines are running all day long. Honestly, don't get started on councils. Uh, 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 well, uh, just to give you a very brief picture up here, you were saying that you use, is it Ringo? That's in, right, yeah. Or Ring and Go? Ringo. Ring, well, up here, they can't even get the act together between different councils that are next to each other to use the same company for the, the parking. So some of them will be using Ringo. Some of them, are, I think, use, is it pay by phone or something? But there's a few different companies, and it depends. I which... mean, a lot of the local authorities here have put their own pay by phone parking systems in place as well. So you'll be set up on, you'll be set up on one, and everything will be you know ready to go, and then you'll literally drive 10 feet down the road and it'll switch into a different local authority, and then you've got to set up again from scratch and roll your credit card. And, you know, if you're in a rush on a job or whatever, it's great if it's already set up. But would it be so hard? I mean, I suppose there's arguments to say, well, then one company would have the monopoly and all that. But for certain things like this, it just makes life so easy. Surely there can be some sort of app that aggregates all all of the different payment systems together. Maybe that does exist, I don't know. But Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of it. But yeah, you, you'd think that would be the sensible thing, but then the convenience of the actual users is way down the list in, well, <laughs> in terms yeah. of their priorities, I think. But uh, it, it's you see, in, in and around Newcastle, there's not that much parking that I run into where you would have to literally feed a metre, but there's a lot of permit parking. And the permit parking is so complicated and varies literally not only street by street, but you could be driving halfway down a street and then suddenly there's another sign full of like 15 double negatives. You're trying to interpret it while kind of sitting, blocking the road. It's like, can I park there? You you are not, not allowed to park between, uh, you know, it's just, and then, and the thing is, 
I don't know what the etiquette is in, in London, but in Newcastle, if you live in a permit area, the general assumption is is that you have a visitor permit to give to tradespeople so that they can park there while they're working at your house. If you're in a if you're in an area that it's it's permit only and there's no alternative, so there's no meters, there's there's literally nowhere else to park other than the permitted area on, on your street, then the assumption is is that the resident will have a, a visitor permit. And generally nine out of ten times they do. But every so often They've left it in their other car, or you know, the yeah. the husband's. Or, or they've run out, or they've only got the thirty minute ones. Yeah, exactly. Or, or so every so often, they don't have a visitor permit, and in that situation, you're completely screwed. There's almost nothing you can do, and and sometimes that can really throw things out because if you're absolutely book chocker for the next three months, and you're getting a one day delay on a project because you can't physically park at the property Mm. and so i got in touch with the council about this and (laughs) yeah and they've got and they say oh no we've got a system for this it's a a tradesperson temporary visitor pass that you can get and it's like all right well that sounds perfect um yeah can i have one of those please yeah it's 300 pounds per year and I was like, what? <laughs> what? And it's like, well, I might as well just take my chances with getting a ticket, you know, for the one or two times that this happens. And and I said to them, out of a matter of interest, how many of these temporary visitor permits or these temporary tradesperson permits have, have you sold? And they said 12. In the, enti- in the whole of that council area, of all the thousands and thousands of tradespeople who work in that area. Yeah, in the whole of the area. And in the entire time that this scheme has been going. And it's like, for goodness sake, isn't it more, isn't it costing you more to run the scheme? Yeah, it's got to be. Than to just say, tradespeople, go onto the website, download load this form, put it in your dash window. It's a temporary permit that tradespeople can use. You know, it's not like we're parking there so we can go shopping all day. No. We are a genuine visitor to that yeah. person's oh, house. Yeah. Yeah, this is the other thing as well. That what's happening in London a lot is that local authorities are are restricting parking to to two hours maximum. So, you know how how can you do your job if you if you can only park for two hours, no no return. You know, you, so you can't move it down the road. To, you've got to actually physically move it to a different zone. It's 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 impossible. I find it so frustrating because it's like, well, what do you? Do you want these houses to just fall into total disrepair? Because you are making it literally impossible for tradespeople to go and do work at these properties. You're making it so difficult. And especially at a time like now where there's quite a lot of work out there anyway, I feel quite sorry for these people who live in these permit areas because your tradespeople just are going to say, you know, sorry, it's more hassle than it's worth. I'll, I'll, it's not It's not worth it. Yeah. I'll I'll pick from all the jobs that don't have that, and then if, if I really run dry of of work, then I can maybe pick up those sort of nightmare parking jobs and jobs in blocks of flats where you're not allowed to use a lift and all this sort of thing. You know? I've heard an apocryphal tale. I don't know if it's actually true, but for people guys who are working in central London, they actually have a a, a young lad just to drive the van around all day. You know, just pay him fifty quid to just to because it's cheaper than parking. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it just insane that's that's just insane um what a bizarre world we live in it's just so so i totally get why certain areas need to be permit parking i don't have a problem with that but the purpose of a permit parking area is to stop strangers from parking in the area and just dumping the cars and going off shopping that's my understanding of a permit area exactly it's not to stop people from visiting your house so if you genuinely need to have someone visiting your house to do some work why do they make that so difficult? There must be easier ways, surely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would love to know what the thinking is behind these these council, these local authority schemes, because I, I, I honestly, I'm not sure there's any thinking behind it. I, you know, it's just beggar's belief what they're what they're what they're doing. It's they're doing. it's just revenue generation for the councils at the end of the day, isn't it? It's it's um, job protection schemes and yeah, okay. Well, that's another whole. <laughs> well, that's that, that's that, that's the no, 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 Andy. They deeply care about the the community and the air we breathe. Who are the councils? It's all about. Think of the children. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I've got asthma. I'm, I'm asthmatic, so I'm not entirely opposed to the general idea of clean air. But come on, let's make this sensible. Exactly. Uh, and, and the other thing is, if you if you are driving around, you know, my little patch of West London or North London or wherever, you know, overwhelmingly the traffic comprises of 
white vans and taxis. You know, it's really not people shopping. It really isn't around here. It, you know, it's people trying to trying to get work done. And the barriers that are put in our way just sort of grind you down after a while. They really do. However, we can pay by phone now, which is which is nice for parking, which is uh, always always a bonus. Dare I ask how much you're paying on parking then per month? Do you think? Oh, uh, it's it's the biggest single expense of mine. About a hundred quid a week. Wow, that that's that's insane. Um, so yes, we have these amazing sort of pocket computers, uh, and you know, parking is one of the one of the benefits of them. Uh, I think I mentioned I'm, I use the the note taking on mine a lot for job notes, work notes, that sort of thing. And I started using that because I used to carry around a little notebook, and I still do occasionally for, to do drawings and things. My, hand, I, my handwriting's terrible. Uh, you know, I, I don't handwrite much at all these days. So I sort of scribble notes, and I was finding that I was struggling to read my <laughs> hastily scribbled notes for, for, you know, job sizes, alcove widths, that sort of thing. So I started making little text notes on my phone. And that was that was that was fantastic. Uh, that was a real a real benefit. And then obviously they all sync back to your laptop, to your computer every so you get those everywhere. Uh, uh you you got you're an Android. I'm Android, yeah. Phone and I'm Android, yeah. I've got I'm on the Apple side of things, but I had I'm I'm ex Apple by the way, so I'm not like I'm I, I don't hate Apple but it's a love-hate relationship with Apple, and I think it's just you know personality types, and I'm a I'm a complete control freak, and I've, yeah, uh, yeah. There's all kinds of things you you're not allowed to yeah, do. What, I think what, uh, with Apple phones, there's all, all kinds of things I don't want to do with them. What, one of the know, biggest yeah. frustrations I had with Apple, I, I'm a big listener of of music and stuff like that, and I have a huge MP3 collection of of, of all my CDs that I've ripped down to MP3, and. With Android, I can just drag and drop them straight onto the phone. Whereas with with Apple, you need to do it all through iTunes and synchronize, and then it suddenly says, "Oh, iTunes is out of date and can't synchronize until it does an update." And it's like all I want to do is copy a track onto my phone to listen to it, and and I just found that uh, eventually that kind iTunes tipped me over the edge with Apple. It was just such, especially on PC, there were so many things with iTunes that just didn't work properly. Just random scroll bars would randomly just disappear for no reason, and it was just like, oh, this is making me so angry this piece of software and and i need to get off it and you know android's got its problems if it lets you if it lets you do what you want to do then then you know great i i, I the reason I, I was asking is that i uh, when the original galaxy note came out this giant phone you know this ridiculous size thing it, it turns out it was exactly the same size only much thinner than the little notepad that i was carrying around to scribble notes so I, so I had a galaxy note i had one of those for a while with a little note pen little scribble stick thing and it was horrible i i, I <laughs> you know i didn't hate android i don't really care one way or the other but it just didn't do for me what what i wanted it to do you know uh, I, i'm not deeply involved in Google's ecosystem. Uh, it was sort of interesting if it could tell me, you know, where I parked the parked the van kind of thing, and then it kept telling me that it was parked at home when I knew yeah, I, could, I was out on a job somewhere, and I could look out the window and see it in the street downstairs, and it was my phone was still telling me that it was parked at home. Uh, uh, and, you know, all kinds of random weirdness kept happening. Uh, you know, how many messaging apps do I need? I don't really want all the Samsung stuff that they put on it. Uh, so, yeah, it wasn't a, wasn't a particularly happy experience for me uh, on that side of things, partly because I live in the, you know, for the most part in, in Apple's e- ecosystem. And for the most part, it works reasonably well. And I've got to say, I know iTunes is a, is a sticking point for a lot of people. Until we started doing this podcast, I haven't touched iTunes for uh, five, six, seven years, something like that. I've never synced any of my recent phones to iTunes. I just just isn't something I do. I think again that's coming from me as a you know a, as a musician and a listener of music, and I, and I do often transfer different albums and stuff that I've bought on onto my phone, and I just find the action of doing that on the Android world is so easy compared to trying to do it through iTunes and stuff. But Plug it into your computer and it's there like another drive. You can drag and drop whatever files you want. On. Then you have to put up with rebooting your phone every couple of days because it'll just gradually get slower and slower and slower. And, you know, I never, I remember when I was um, using iPhones, 
I would go months and months without rebooting it, and I would never have problems with it slowing down the way Android phones seem to just randomly slow, slow down for no reason. But I guess this is what happens when you've got the OS and hardware not being made by the same people. And, and exactly, a, and, it, and it's all very tightly controlled on the Apple side as well. For, you know, for good and bad, it means that you are restricted in, in some things that you can do. If those are things that you care deeply about, then yeah, it's, you know, there's no harm in being on a separate platform. And uh, I, I've sort of drifted away from music to an extent. My wife's the big music fan in the house now. And, and she's old school. She likes to buy her music. She's all bought from iTunes. But we've got music going back, you know, decades I guess thousands of tracks are, all, are are still copy protected, so you know we've got to play them through the the appropriate system. Yeah, we've got a we've got a Sonos music system at home, and we've got all our all our tracks on a stored on a external drive on a NAS, and you know it'll it'll pick those up, it'll play quite well. But the you know, the crazy thing is, if we were to buy the there's a new Apple smart speaker out. Uh, which I quite like to listen to, but it doesn't do anything I want. <laughs> it just it doesn't it doesn't connect to to the bits of music that I have. Uh, it's not multi room at the moment because it's still using AirPlay, I think it is, which is a you know AirPlay two isn't out yet. There, there's a whole host of niggles with it. Apparently, the sound quality is amazing, but that's that's the only reason I'd be interested in it. It's supposed to be really good. Uh, it's supposed to sound great. I say I've got Sonos and it's it's pretty good, but the software drives me nuts. Have you got any smart home stuff? So smart smart lights and stuff? No, um, I did have. This was before. All this came out really, um, but in the one of the properties I was that I renovated. Oh my word! It's coming on for ten years ago, is it? <laughs> uh, I was going to say a couple of years ago, but <laughs> but I put in smart lighting everywhere that you could control from your iPhone. I think it was made by a company called Racco. I think off the top of my head, it was really expensive because all basically all the light switches were effectively wireless devices, and then you would have a wireless receiver in the ceiling. Uh, which was connected to the lighting circuit. And then you'd also have an internet-enabled wireless device that connected to all the receivers so that you could control everything over your um, over your Wi-Fi. Sorry, not an internet-enabled, but a Wi-Fi-enabled thing that basically plugged it into your, into your LAN and then you could get onto it just via your, your Wi-Fi. And that was fantastic, worked really well. It was before all of this home tech came out where you can now go to IKEA and buy Wi-Fi-enabled light bulbs, which is just totally bizarre when i think about how much uh, honestly each receiver was about 120 quid and then the light switches were about 70 quid each you know though it was a lot of money but it was quite a high spec house and it was one of these things that it really finished it off and it was quite a big selling point for the house being able to show people around it's like well you know you can literally just press a button to ch- completely change the mood lighting in a particular room and obviously everything was dimmable you'd literally have kind of a almost like a mixer display on your phone and you could say well those, those lights I want light at this and you'd set all your presets and then it's just you could just say right I want ambient lighting or I want movie lighting or you know I think it's pretty much what these new what are they called the- internet of things yeah we've got the Philips Hue lights in our in our front room we put those in a while back yeah uh, and yeah you can do all these funky colors and things and most of the time we have it set to like a slightly warm white you know <laughs> <laughs> and we dim them occasionally, uh, and we've got a couple of the little, the little Echo Amazon Echo Dot things, and they're sort of you know fifty fifty success rate with uh, <laughs> with using those to to switch lights on and off and things. Most of the time, it's just easier to to lean across and hit the plus sign on the remote. You know, yeah, I think they're a lovely gadget. And I remember when I first put the the Racco system in, I thought it was amazing. As I say, it was a good selling point, but I found after a couple of months. I very rarely used it, you know. You would you would switch the lights on from the switch on the wall and you would switch them off at the switch on the wall and then it suddenly dawns on you, why have I paid best part of 300 quid for a, a light switch and receiver combination, you know. <laughs> but coming, coming back to what you were saying about taking measurements and stuff and writing them down by, by text, I'll tell you what I do. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's where we were, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I couldn't remember how we got off that. But uh, what I do, I take photographs of all the measurements. That's a good idea. And because I found sometimes it would be like, oh, well, I've taken a measurement. And then it's like, oh, did I take that to the 
to this corner or did I where did I measure it to I, you know it just kind of drops out your head or was there a skirting board there or wasn't uh, uh, you know okay so I take photographs of all all the measurements but it makes it quite quick for just going around the house and I literally just take photographs of the tape measure sometimes it's a little bit tricky if you're trying to kind of hold a tape measure and take a photograph at the same time I, I've got uh, the the tape measure that I take out on quotes is a like forged steel one with a magnet on the end and and the magnet's quite handy for that because it just kind of yeah, that's a good idea you can sometimes yeah. hook it onto the edge of a corner is it a corner bead the metal bead that you get on the corners of rooms outside corner yes of the measurement but i find that works quite well then you've got a whole load of photographs that you, you've got to try and figure out which bits were what yeah you do have to be a little bit careful that you've taken a, a wide enough angle that you can work out what it is or what angle you're holding the phone at and stuff like that but I, I take photographs of everything on the job because I, i've got the memory of a goldfish i've got a literally just a, a, a folder per customer on my computer and every single photograph of every job right from the first quote right through to completion is all all there on a per customer basis and phone phone cameras are uh, astonishingly good these days as well amazing they? the, amazing the, the quality you can get from them is absolutely astonishing well, i mean my phone's just a, a galaxy s5 and w- one of the reasons that i've been reluctant to upgrade from it is that the camera on it is amazing i mean the phone's getting a bit sluggish now because it's pretty old mm. but uh, the camera is fantastic as as smartphone cameras go i've been pretty impressed with that one but it, it is due an upgrade like it's it's getting on a bit the yeah. screen's cracked and it's kind of held together by dust and <laughs> <laughs> dust and sticky tape yeah fantastic what about smart watches got into smart watches yet any of that stuff no no it just wouldn't you know what it is uh I mean, I'm at the point now on my phone where I've pretty much got all notifications switched off, apart from text message and, and calls. I generally, you know, I don't sleep with the phone anywhere near us. Um, if 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 it's in the same room, it's switched off. I have a quite a, a strict rule on that, just because I think sleep time is for sleeping <laughs> and work time is for working. And if you've got a phone switched on next to the bed... yeah. There's far too much of a temptation just to be on it for the entire night. And I, I was, you know, having quite late nights just randomly reading rubbish on the internet and stuff. And eventually it's like, no, I need to get this phone away from me at night time. I'm, I'm missing out on sleep and things. Yeah. And what about, yeah, smartwatch. So no, it, I would end up breaking it on jobs. You know, it would just get, I don't wear a watch at all because I, I, kept, break, I, I kept breaking them. I've always... Always want to watch. Always love wearing watches. Now I bought the, the the Apple Watch, of course, when it came out, uh, and that's actually really, I, again I, I smashed the <laughs> smashed the face of it <laughs> a couple of months after I got it, and I'm been bothered to to replace it, and I'm been bothered to to replace to upgrade to a new watch either. It's quite handy. I quite like it. I do actually do quite like getting notifications and things on on my wrist because doing what we do, you know, it's quite often that you have both hands full, and if you do get a you know, something come into your phone or, or phone call or whatever else. Well, you know, is that important enough to stop what I'm doing and have a look at it? Do I need to put the thing down? It's actually quite nice just to be able to flick your wrist over and see what it is. And, oh, no, it's some some Instagram thing. I'll deal with that later. I just find 99.9% of the time that notification that's coming in just isn't important. I can't think of a single instance where someone's phoned us and... It couldn't have waited a couple of hours until I'd finished that one bit. So generally on jobs, I've, I've got podcasts downloaded on my phone. My phone's into flight mode and I'm listening to podcasts and I'm not getting disturbed. I, I just find it too distracting to get torn away from what I'm doing. Because if it does ring, I have to at least check who's ringing. Mm. I'm not disciplined enough to not check it all the time. So I find, okay, we'll we'll just kind of leave that off. Normally either just switch a ringer off or, or put it into flight mode and, and be undisturbable while I'm I'm working on a job. And especially and I've got a really flaky reception in, in the workshop anyway. So generally it's it's really impractical trying to talk to anyone. Yes, mine's the same. I have to sort of head to the door if anybody phones me. But to be honest, I, I very rarely get phone calls these days. Uh, overwhelmingly the the initial point of contact or, or people know to message me or email me. Well which means that if a phone call comes in uh, it's somebody who from somebody I know, then it's important enough for me to to have a look at it <laughs> and to, to have a listen to. Yeah, I mean, if I'm if I'm expecting a call, then obviously I would I would have it left on or whatever. If it, you know, if I 
if there's an urgent thing that I need to hear from the customer, you know, I've, I've asked them a question, I can't get on with another bit of the job until they get back to me on, on a certain point. I don't know. It's, it's trying to get that balance. But Yeah, sure. There's some interesting bits of tech coming up. Uh, augmented reality, some of the things we've seen uh, uh, look pretty, pretty wacky. But one of the things that was demoed was uh, an actual measuring app. So, you, you know, you have your, your phone out with the camera active and you mark a point at one end of something and you just mark the other end and it gives you the measurement of it. You know, if that was accurate, and that's that's the big question, of course. But if that's accurate, that would be amazing. I saw that because it can literally just dimension your entire room for you. Can't it? Once it's got two reference points or something, then it can work out the rest. Or I can't remember. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, I find for the sort of work we do where we generally need pretty accurate measurements, I'll be staggered if it's accurate enough it's it's maybe enough to get a, a very rough idea well that's the question isn't it i mean if, you, if you're just looking for square meters of a room to paint or something then it's probably yeah it's probably okay now but uh, if it's genuinely ac- millimeter accurate like a laser measure then no yeah i'd be all over that but yeah i'm not sure i'd entirely trust it but in- interesting interesting the way things are going and again you know i mean these things are only going to get better absolutely and and these are all part of the smartphone world you know this little pocket computer with with apps in it that lets us do amazing things whether it's playing music or uh, listening to podcasts making and receiving phone calls checking your emails or, or whatever else i mean the email thing's an interesting one because i don't have my phone set up at all to receive business emails right i i can only receive business emails from from home and I make it pretty clear on my website, if you want to get in touch, if it's a new job and I have a message on my phone as well, if it's a new job, you need to get in touch by email. Mm. And that tends to work fine. I had a couple of situations where someone would email me five minutes before turning up to a job to say, actually, they want to reschedule. And it's like, well, sorry, but I can't guarantee that if it's five minutes before I turn up to a job that I'm going to see that email before I turn up at your job with all my tools and truck, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And, and sorry, but in that situation, surely the socially acceptable thing to do is to give them a ring. Yeah, You don't just send them a blind email and not get a response and assume that everything's going to be all right. Because what I find is that I've got some clients who who treat email like text messaging. They'll send you, you know, three word emails, and they'll have, there'll be this stream of them back and forth. The whole written communication thing through text messaging and WhatsApp and instant messaging and email is all melding together, so that they're they're almost interchangeable. So I I. I I don't think I could not have <laughs> my emails on my phone. I just, you know, I, it, it's it just got to have it. You know, I can't, I can't not have it there. That's, that's, I couldn't work like that. It's interesting. I've had it like that for about the last year, and so far it's not caused us a problem. But I do just have to be a little bit careful, you know, because there's certain things that you're going to get through on email, you know, even if it's just things like address details or, you know, someone emails you the, the code to get through a gate at their property, or, you know, because generally what I then do is I have everything into a calendar appointment just through Google calendars or whatever. And I have all the pertinent information in the calendar appointment, which obviously I do have on my phone. Everything that I need for the job, I have kind of summarised in the calendar appointment. Everything down to what I'm going to be charging them at the, at the end so that I know how much money to ask them for <laughs> at the end of the job. Yeah, okay, yeah. But I don't include all the, the detail in, in that. That it's, it's very much kind of a summary of uh, the customer name, their phone number, obviously their, their address. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Maybe a very quick summary of, like, if they've given us a bullet point list of what they are expecting from the job you know, or what I've said I'm going to do or how many shelves there's going to be, you know, just things like, yeah, I don't want to forget that bit. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the final cost, assuming that I'm going to be just charging them on credit card when I leave. And as I say, the, the, coming back to the tech thing, the credit card thing has changed the way I do business. Absolutely fantastic. I, I use it um, probably for 95% of my jobs now. It means that I'm getting paid. Yeah. As soon as I'm leaving site, I'm not having to wait for getting that cash into the business. And it just means that it's one less thing to, to worry about. And you can invoice people through it as well. If, if you do want to give them slightly longer to pay, you can you can actually send an invoice out through the, the credit card uh, app on your phone. And it just works really 
really well. Do you need the card reader to be able to use it? It, it, it is based around that. It, is, it isn't an app-based thing. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think you can do the invoice thing just from the app. I don't think you don't need the card. The card reader is only if you're taking a physical card payment. But you can't take a card payment without without the card reader. Basically, there's no way there's no way to physically put in the card number. You can send them an invoice, and that would then send an email to them. Okay. With details of how to pay, and they'd pay through their service, or, but but online, yeah. Okay. Exactly. So as far I've never used the invoice thing. I, I always just use it for the, the physical card thing. Interesting. But as far as I'm aware, if you do the invoice thing, it sends them an email and it says click here to pay. And it tells them what the payment terms are, like how long they've got to pay, and, and yeah. gives them a nice little invoice, and then they just fill it in and, and pay online, and that's all handled through the the back end of the the app. But as I say, I, I, I generally just do it straight away by credit card, and that's it all done and dusted and forgotten about, and yeah, most good. customers are, are happy with it. And then it will automatically send out a receipt by either text or email to the customer, which is kind of a nice touch, and you Fantastic. can customise it with your logo and all that sort of thing. So it, it looks really professional, and I think customers are generally very happy paying on card these days, you know. So of course, uh, then it's uh, then it's done, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I, I find tech wise, yeah, we, sh- we should have we should have them as a sponsor. We, we, yeah, maybe <laughs> I shouldn't bang on about them too much until they actually give us some money. <laughs> Other than that, I have bought a little tablet that I was hoping to use more on jobs, like a touchscreen tablet with a stylus and things. I, I've got all these great expectations of going out to jobs and scribbling out little 3D designs in front of the customer and saying, do you want it like this or would you like it like this? It sounds like a can of worms you're opening up there, mate. Well, I, t- I tried it on the first job that I thought, you know what it is, I'm, I'm going to try this on a job, see what happens. And for some reason it got stuck on a pink marker pen <laughs> as a, the chosen... Um, I couldn't get it to be a black pencil on the screen. It was stuck in this big, fat pink pen. And whenever I tried to change it to just a pencil, it wouldn't change. It was stuck on this... And I was sort of trying to draw this intricate 3D design of what this solution was going to look like for a customer. And it was all in this awful pink, big, fat marker pen on the screen. It was just, it looked terrible. And it's like, maybe, mm, maybe not. Maybe this maybe tech not. hasn't quite evolved to the point where this is going to be a practical solution. Cool. But, uh, when the iPad came out, I started, I was a big iPad fan because it was exactly what I was looking for, a giant, giant phone. And I tried taking that out on jobs. And of course, you're, you're stuck finger drawing on that. And it's much only recently that they brought out the Apple pen, pencil thing. Uh, and that's supposed to be really good. Uh, and my wife's got the iPad Pro that'll use it, but uh, she hasn't bothered with the pencil because you know she has no real need for it. But again, I, I I just found I'm more comfortable with a pencil and a piece of paper, just drawing a little a little sketch, a little a little note, uh, and putting a text note into a you know, into a, a note on my phone. Yeah, I think for I think you're right. You know what it is. I, I think for I had this kind of idealized view of how this would work in my mind when I bought this thing and uh, (laughs) this was another thing while drawing this ridiculous pink marker pen diagram on the computer depending on what angle I was holding the tablet at it kept on changing orientation it's like ah I couldn't easily lock it into the correct orientation I haven't quite worked out how to do that on this because it's Windows 10 I think and it's different to how it works on Android and, and it was like ah it keeps changing orientation while I'm trying to draw and it's like, oh, my God. And then I think the, the piece de resistance with it was when I held it at a certain angle and the whole thing just switched off. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's like, oh, my God. So so it's like, yeah, the, the first experience of using this as some sort of new tech for going into jobs and drawing out what things would look like, it didn't work very well. I think I'm going to revert to pen and paper. Did you get the job? Yes, <laughs> they were suitably impressed by my pick marker pen drawing. They did. <laughs> so despite despite the the tech, I think they appreciated the effort and maybe understood the what I was going through. <laughs> <laughs> it's still great for going out and showing them a finished solution. And if I can get SketchUp actually working on this, and for some reason SketchUp doesn't work on it, but um, if I can get SketchUp working on it and I can go out to a, co- a customer site with it and actually go through the 3D design with them. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, that would be quite handy as well. But uh, other than that, tech-wise, other than back-end tech, obviously for sending out quotes and 
stuff like that, which we've already talked about. I know there's a lot of apps out there for like job management and contract management. I've never looked into them and I haven't tried them. I think if you're maybe getting into more complex projects where you're having teams of people coming in to do jobs, maybe that would be something that's worthwhile. I know I know the interior designer that I do a lot of work for, she has one uh, because she, uh, she's handling many, many different projects at, at once and lots of moving parts um, to each project, So, I, of which I am but a small part. Uh, and that seems to work pretty well for her, but uh, I, I've, I've never looked into any of They generally seem to be way too complex for the for the level of jobs that I'm involved with. You know, there's only me doing the work, so <laughs> if I haven't scheduled it in, then, you know, that's down to me, really. I, I don't need to keep track of when people are producing things because there's only me doing it. I was hearing about this contract management package that um, a few smaller building firms, maybe even bigger building firms, but um, it, it basically, if you've got multi-trades or, or, or multiple different trades working on a particular contract you'll not be able to get paid for your little bit until you've taken a photograph of the bit that you've done, uploaded it to this app, and then it basically ticks all the boxes in the app to say, yes, you've done that bit. They obviously approve it at the back end. But this is all integrated within this. I don't know what the app's called, but it's all integrated within this one kind of contract management app where you literally take pictures of the the bits that you've done and, and upload it and you don't get paid until you've done that bit. So doubtless, especially younger people getting into the game, this is the sort of thing you got, you are going to run into more and more on jobs and you've got to get with it with the tech because you will be left behind. You, you will find that people, customers will get so used to using different types of tech that if you're not up to speed on it, you will unfortunately get forgotten about to a degree i think we've we may have mentioned it in a, in a previous podcast but it's astonishing how how many people aren't into it or interested in it at all you know the idea of sending a text message for some people is is baffling for them i once had a, a an older customer very very intelligent uh she'd been a fashion designer she came out of college in post-war uh and worked for william hartnell yeah one of the Queen's gown makers, and she'd, she'd worked in the fashion business all through the, you know, late 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, uh, and 80s. <laughs> you know, an amazing career. Uh, she had a, she bought an answering machine, an answer phone for home, and she didn't understand how to use it. And she said, well, you know, how do I get my messages back? Well, you just hit, hit the play button. And she had no clue what the, what the play, pause, stop buttons were. I said, well, do, you, do you not have a video recorder? Oh, I've got one. Do we need it? I said, no, I could just, you know, show you the buttons. She said, it's up in the loft. <laughs> so, well, you know, <laughs> she'd, but because she, she didn't record television, she didn't really watch television, she was out doing theatre and stuff, uh, this was completely, completely passed her by, the idea that a little triangle on its side might be a play button and that a square was stop and two bars was pause meant nothing to it's her. interesting it's it's so and and like kids are so immersed in it now from such an early age you know and, and kids are brought up with iphones in their hands from like the, the age of what two three four you know that it, it's just it, everything about using the technology is so natural now to to younger people because they've grown up using it from such an early age and they're fearless you know they have no no concerns about it at all they they are no, no concerns about breaking it, you know, or, or something. Those are the people who, in twenty years' time, are going to be your customers, and they are going to be a hundred percent immersed in the tech. And if you, if you're not up to speed with that, they won't use you. Simple as that. So we're we're quite fortunate that we're not. We still have enough of a quite a varied range of generations that we do work for, from younger people through to people who have who have never really used very much tech. So, but it's only going to become more and more of a requirement of the job, I think. Yeah, I think so. So, we've we've massively overrun as usual. Well, as usual. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been telling people it's an hour-ish long yeah. fortnightly podcast. <laughs> there's um, there's loads of other things I was going to talk about, but I'm one of them I'm going to leave until next time because we were talking briefly, I'm not going to go into it now because it'll take another half an hour, but we talked briefly last time about that you have, well, in fact, we both to a degree have standard rates for how much we charge for certain things. We've also got kind of a day rate in the back of our mind. I've, I've also got an hourly rate in the back of my mind. Um, but generally, we go out to the customer and say, uh, 
an alcove unit is going to cost X, Y, Z. And that is generally the, the simplest way of, of going about things. So uh, what I decided to do, I was on a model floating shelf job and it was just a dead simple dead nice floating shelf job and i decided i've got a standard price for how much i charge per floating shelf depending on the finish and all that sort of thing do you, do you discount those if there are multiples yes you well uh, yeah and um, i'll come to that i just decided okay let's actually work this out properly for the sake of thoroughness and for the sake of the podcast and i might also break it down even further on my patreon at, at some point but Let's take it to the nth degree of every single strip of wood, every single little bracket, every screw, every plug, every bit of glue, every nail. And I decided to go through it to the nth degree and properly work out with current prices, how much is it actually costing me to put up a floating shelf and how much should I be charging people? And the good news is, is that I wasn't far out, but the interesting bit was having to paint them and that, I need to be charging way more for finishing, put put it that way. So, but I'll go into the detail of it um, maybe next time if 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 we remember. Mm, yeah, fascinating, fascinating. I, I suspect I'm I'm exactly the same in in massively undercharging for painting. Um, but we'll we'll go through that. So. Um, any picks of the week for you? Picks of the week? Yeah, I wanted to talk uh, very quickly uh, on YouTube. There's a guy called Joey from uh, New Zealand, and I followed him for a while. He's called King Post Timberworks uh, on YouTube, uh, and he's done some beautiful, beautiful work. He, he's one man band, got quite a big workshop. I think he's in Auckland, uh, not sure, but uh, in New Zealand anyway. And I first came across him. Uh, just one of his videos popped up in my YouTube feed where he did forgotten joinery techniques. He'd found an old book uh, and he did some forgotten you know, samples of these forgotten joinery techniques. And it's a fantastic video. It's really, really good. I'll, I'll We'll put the link in the show notes. But he's done some beautiful work. As most New Zealanders seem to, he's, he's bought a plot of land and he's building a house and you know, all the rest of it. Um, but he's a, he's a great, uh, really, really skilled maker. Does a lot of similar sort of thing to the kinds of things that we do, you know, built-ins and stuff. But he's also done some really lovely sort of proper quality cabinet making, curved bow-fronted uh, armoires and curved legs and you know, all, all this kind of really sophisticated, very, very skilled stuff. He's, he's fantastic. Well, the last one I saw of his was he's just made a plywood kitchen for somebody, birch ply kitchen, which is really lovely. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my pick of the week for YouTube. And as far as podcast, again, I've head down grafting, so I haven't done a great deal, but I came across one called the dusty life, uh, three guys, uh, American. So, you know, not entirely relevant to what we do, uh, but oh, interesting listening to, to to three guys talk about the the uh, their woodworky uh, projects. Fantastic! So I'm subscribed to Dusty Life, but I haven't listened to it for a long time. It's again, I, I find I get into one podcast and I, I kind of churn through the back catalogue, and you kind of forget about every other podcast out there until you you're caught up. That'll be people with us. They'll be listening to our podcasts, and uh, they'll have completely forgotten about all the other stuff they subscribed. That's a weird thing to think that people might be listening through our back catalogue in like fifty <laughs> years' time. Isn't <laughs> it a bizarre thing? In fact, I was chatting where well, here's a quick shout out for uh, Richard Morley of um, Makers International podcast. Oh yeah, uh, Brain Brain Fizz, Brain Fizz, isn't it? I brain think, yeah. And uh, I, I, I was just dropped him a note on instagram i think he's just hitting his sixteen thousand subscriber mark on on youtube uh. and uh i was just chatting to my wife the other night and it's like do you realize and and she was saying to us do you realize that you've now got enough subscribers to fill newcastle arena literally just with your subscribers and i was yeah. like no surely not and I looked at it, and yeah, Newcastle Arena capacity is eleven thousand people. You and and Richard are, um, you know, getting close to your twenty thousand mark, and that's a that's a London O2 arena. Is it really? I haven't I haven't, uh, haven't looked. Wow, that's amazing. You could fill the London O2 just with people who are subscribed to you on YouTube. How humbling is that? Amazing. Imagine what we could do if they all got together with your subscribers as well. Actually, I think there's a fair bit of crossover. There, I think so. there is quite a lot of crossover, but yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's such a humbling thing to think, you know, that that's, it's not until you visualise it in your mind what 
what that would look like. Well, I know we're starting to ramble a bit here. <laughs> we will wrap this up, I promise. But one of the things that uh, 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 that I came across, you know, when you start a YouTube channel, you, you end up a bit like writing a book. You know, if you want to write a book, you start reading a lot of books. And if you want to start a YouTube channel, you watch a lot of YouTube and a lot of uh, the advice that people give. And there's a guy called Roberto Blake uh, who has a channel and he's done lots of, lots of very good advice. And one of the things that he said that really struck a chord with me about starting a YouTube channel was that if, if you're a new YouTuber and you've only got you know 20, 30, 40 subscribers, or whatever, how do you how do you, how on earth do you grow that? He said if if you if somebody asked you to give a talk to a group of you know 20 or 30 people, you'd stand at the front of that and think, crikey, that's quite a crowd. Now it can grow from there, obviously, and it does to the extent that we've managed to grow to is is just extraordinary. But everybody starts with 30 or 40 people. Yeah. So who, you, who have you been watching to? Who you've been watching to? Who have you been watching? Who have you been listening to? Briefly gave a mention before to uh, Gary Thompson Joinery, who's, um, as I say, he's an absolute craftsman. Up in Aberdeen, amazing joinery cabinet making work. Generally all solid oak work that he does that I've seen, but it's all giant kind of, um, well, I'm saying giant, but it's quite big bootcases, um, built-ins, but they're they're really stunning craftsmanship. You know, I can only aspire to one day do work like that. I I would love to be able to to be that good one day. Uh, He just does some lovely, lovely work. Um, the other guy, are you familiar with a YouTuber called Mike Farrington? Yes, I've just come across him recently. He's got this massive, absolutely vast workshop. It's like an industrial estate parked in his backyard. It's absolutely huge. You think Jimmy Duresta's new one in upstate New York is big. This place is absolutely huge, isn't it? Well, to be fair, it's not as big as Jimmy's new not? workshop that he's built. Not as big as the one that Jimmy's building i don't think let's just say anybody who can fly anybody who can fly a drone into their workshop <laughs> has a workshop that's way too big <laughs> so so mike farrington he has the same hairstyle as me ah. and he's a, a, a cabinet maker i'm not sure whereabouts in the states but he does some really really lovely cabinet making work mdf basher similar to us you know it seems to be largely mdf his workshop is 2,800 square feet. Oh, right. Is that all? I mean, it's still, you know, 10 times bigger than what I've got at the minute. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but he's got loads of gear as well, hasn't he? He's got every every little piece of equipment you could ever imagine. The gear he has got. Oh, man. And I love his attitude to it. You know, yes, this is expensive gear, but if you're going to be doing this for the next 50 years of your life, it's probably quite a sensible purchase but he's got um one of the really interesting things that i would not seen before was an mdf edge polisher that he uses mm. um and it's kind of a sanding disc that he puts in his table saw. His table saw yeah have you seen right. this before i've never yeah. seen that before i've never seen it before no i've never, never seen it anywhere uh, it's purpose built for sanding the edge of mdf prior to finishing and it gets literally a polished edge on on the mdf as i say it goes into his table saw and he runs it through and it polishes the edges of the mdf i thought that was very interesting the most amazing thing he's got have you seen this assembly table that goes up and down yes oh yeah, my, yeah, i yeah. want that assembly table i don't care how much it is that's on my bucket list of things for my workshop. That's the most. Im- it's about the size of your workshop. It is about the, the size of my table. workshop. Um, it's basically think of a, an MFT eight by four at least, maybe maybe bigger. It's on a pneumatic scissor lift that goes up and down, and you can. So if you're making a big piece, you can bring it all the way down to the floor, put your big piece on it raise it up to whatever height you want, work on it. You know, if you're doing a little bit of fine detail stuff, you can bring it right up. And it's on wheels, so you can wheel it around to the window if you want. <laughs> I, I want that workbench. I want that assembly bench. Amazing. Giant workshop. Not something that I can ever really hope to have over here unless I literally buy some sort of industrial warehouse. But, yeah, it, it's lovely to see what can be done if you've if you've got the space. He's, even, he's got um, a machine just for drilling the... Shelf pin holes in, yes. in shelves where it but, drills, but doing fifteen at a time or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got it's effectively got fifteen drill bits at exactly the right position, 
and you just pull a handle and it does all of your shelf pin holes in the perfect position all in one go instantly. And it's like, oh. I think he said he bought that from a company that was going out of business. So, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, we'll let other people make the uh, the big investments, I think. But uh, His channel, I think, is going to get quite big. He's he's up to about 11,000, 12,000, but he's only got a handful of videos. So Yeah, uh, I'm very, always very impressed by anybody who can do, who can generate a, a really good subscriber count from a small number of videos. You, you know you're... You know, you're on the mark there. And his videos are just really nicely shot as well, you know, like nice camera angles, nice bit of bokeh on the on the um, shots and nice little bits of kind of intermingling shots with pictures of his family and all this sort of thing. But it's a really interesting channel to watch. But don't get put off by his giant workshop and amazing tools. <laughs> just for you, it's an inspirational kind of aspirational Thing. Uh, just a quick personal announcement, if I may, Andy. I uh, just want to say congratulations to my nephew, Anthony, and his wife, Sabrina. They had a new baby yesterday. Master Thomas John Millard has been welcomed into the family, so uh, mum and baby both doing well. So congratulations to you both. Uh, well done, Ant and Sabrina. Oh, well. That's their second uh, boy. Congrats, guys. Let's go alongside with big brother Ben. Uh, but that's uh, my main news for this week. Uh, it's been a pleasure, of course, talking to you, Andy. My favourite conversation of the week. And once again, one of the longest... <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, we've overrun massively as per usual, but I think that's going to be a, a regular feature of the podcast. Keeps us on my toes on the editing. So, as we said before, you know, pop onto iTunes, give us a review on there. The more reviews we can get on on iTunes, the better. Absolutely overwhelmed with the reviews that you've already left on there. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much indeed. And of course, you can always support us directly on Patreon. We're at uh, patreon.com forward slash measuring up podcast. And I am making that forward slashing motion as I say that and he's flinching we've got a couple of people uh, who are uh, very generously donating to the cause to keep us going yes thank you so much to the people who have have already supported us on there that's absolutely fantastic and uh, we've set a couple of goals on there that if we get 50 patrons we're going to definitely record a season two and if we get 500 patrons we're going to go to weekly but that's going to be a little bit more down the line i think but you know chuck in a dollar and uh we'll we'll work towards that goal if you can on patreon absolutely uh and let's see where this uh podcast journey takes us oh and feedback to twitter um measuring up pc isn't it measuring up pc on twitter measuring up pc on on the twitter and on instagram uh, measuring up podcast on instagram as well yeah absolutely uh and we'll see you next time two weeks yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs>